In the name of the holy and undivided Trinity, one God. Amen. Oh God, please give me the understanding to know what I ought to do. And allow me, through the grace of Jesus Christ, to be able to fulfill the work you have given me. We have probably heard this reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans many times in our lives. But still, this quick once through reading of this section can still be a little difficult to understand. So I'd like to talk a little bit about our selection from the book of Romans. In this section, we read about the flesh, we read about the spirit. Later on, we read about the body. The flesh is the way to sin and death. The spirit is the way to Christ and everlasting life and the body. Well, for Paul, the body and the flesh are completely two different things. For the body is good. The body is good. It is the flesh that leads us into sin, not the body. That's why he can say that Jesus appeared in the likeness of flesh, not the likeness of the body, for Jesus was fully human, but he was not tempted into sin. For the flesh leads to death, the spirit gives us eternal life. So even though the body may die because we are sinful beings in the eyes of Paul, the body may die but the spirit that we live in lets us be born again, raised in our bodies to love Christ and serve Christ in eternity. I'm not going to ignore our gospel today, but I wanted to talk a little bit about Paul because there is a little connection between the gospel and what Paul has written. Let's turn to the gospel. Jesus left the house, sat down by the sea. His followers came to hear him, too many, so that he got into a boat, sat in the boat, and taught the people standing beside the sea. It's a very serene, quiet image. But there's something amiss in this picture. Our reading today leaves out the very opening phrase of the first verse. We start with, on that same day. What day? This is the day Jesus had spent talking to the Pharisees, trying without succeeding, but trying to get them to understand, to understand what God had in store for the world, for God's beloved children, and the Pharisees did not understand. So I don't know if it was frustration, weariness, just needing some air. But out of these heavy discussions, seemingly fruitless discussions, Jesus goes and sits by the sea. The crowd comes and he gets into the boat and he teaches because that is what Jesus does. He teaches. But I think he was still thinking about the Pharisees. For no matter how many seeds he was scattering, they were not understanding. And he looks out on the crowd, the crowd whom he loves. And he sees those who've come joyfully to hear him teach. And he realizes that some, when faced with adversity, hardship, persecution, will turn away. For their faith has not taken root in their soul. 
and there are others where the faith does take root. But because of the concerns of the world, the need for money, that faith is choked out. But I think he looked out there and hoped too that there were some, some people whose soil was rich and would hear and understand and bear forth fruit abundantly, 30, 60, 100 fold. I think about this parable and I know that I have been in more than one place when the seeds have been scattered. I can empathize with the Pharisees for there are times when God has spoken to me through scripture and through deeds and I have just not comprehended what God is trying to tell me. And there are too many times to number when the cares of the world, when the concerns of how I'm gonna earn a living, the details of everyday life have overwhelmed my faith. And I have experienced joy with no root. I remember back in 1973, I was a little younger then. Billy Graham came to my hometown of Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee is known for a few things, but one of them is home of the University of Tennessee and a very large football stadium. It now holds over 100,000 people, but back then was only around 75,000 or 80,000. And this stadium was full to hear Billy Graham. A solid week, every night. And I went every night. And every night, I sang, listened to the prayers, heard the speaking. And there was the altar call. Now, I was always way up in the second deck. But I made my way down down through the lower level and out onto the field and joyfully knelt on that astroturf. But the route was too shallow. I was happy to participate and join in the crowd and praise God, but that did not make a difference in my life. I went back to school. For I had time to develop. So I think about this gospel reading and I say, I have been on many parts of this story. So this is not just a one-time scattering of seeds. So that's why I turn to Isaiah and the psalm. For as rain and snow fall down from heaven and do not return empty, but nourish the earth. So is God's word. God's word does not return empty. It brings forth fruit, forth grain. It covers the hills in multicolored flowers, grasses, even the paths are overabundant in vegetation. We have all seen pictures or images or even the thing itself, a tree growing out of a rock. That is the word of God. That's how the word of God works. It may be cast upon a rock, but it doesn't just sit there. It sinks in and it turns that rock into good soil. To good soil. And that tree will bear forth abundantly. And that is what we are called to do. We are not 
expected to always be open to the Word of God. We pray that we are. But we are always working to become the rich, good soil. But we have times in our lives when we don't understand. We have times when the thorns are too many. This is why I started with Paul. Because Paul recognized that we had thorns in the way. He himself called it a thorn in his flesh. That call to stray from the Spirit, to stray from Jesus. But God keeps watering the earth. And the seeds keep growing and the roots keep sinking into the earth and turning rock and clay into fertile soil. And we get to show forth God's love abundantly. I want to take a little trip back to that football stadium. Same year, 1973. But in the fall, during football season, Tennessee had an amazing quarterback. He could run, he could pass. He started for three years. You may say, well, why not four? Back then, freshmen could not play on the varsity team, so he started the starting quarterback every year he could be. He led the team to a bowl game every single year. Now you say, eh, everybody goes to a bowl game, but not back then. Things were different. There were not that many bowl games. And he electrified the crowd with his performance. We come draft day, he was drafted 306th, but not as a quarterback, as a defensive back. And he said, no thank you, and went and played in the Canadian Football League. he was the most valuable player, led the team to two championships, is in the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. But there is a reason he was not drafted as a quarterback in the National Football League. It's because he's black. I cannot tell you how many times I have heard black people aren't smart enough to be quarterback. This is systemic racism. You say that was 1973. Later on, I've heard of Peyton Manning. He played four years for Tennessee, won all kinds of Award set records. He never won a national championship. He had a great pro career. The next year, T. Martin led Tennessee to a national championship. He set record for the highest percentage of completions during a football game. He wasn't drafted either. And he is black. Why do I bring this up? Because the Black Lives Matter movement is important. Some of the thorns in my side are that I cannot bring myself to go out and join a crowd and protest, not in this time of pandemic. But I can join our small neighborhood gathering where we stand on the street wearing our masks six feet apart holding signs, asking for justice. Now most people who drive by honk their horns, thumbs up, black power, in appreciation of what we're doing. There's the man that deliberately circled the block and drove by us again to give us all the finger. Or the one that stops at the intersection and 
yells out Black Lives Matter as a terrorist organization four or five times. Or the more subtle ones which just drive by shaking their head no. And I look at our group of people. We're all older. We're all white. What are we doing? With the help of God, we are sowing seeds. For I think so much of the anti-Black Lives Matter movement is simply not understanding. And we're sowing seeds. And God's love will see that those seeds sprout. It may not be soon, but it will happen. It is like that tree and the rock. It will burrow through the hard surface and enter into the hearts, forming rich and fertile soil. We're on those fields where every color imaginable is growing in flowers and grasses and grains. We, in every color, faith, culture, imaginable will be on those same hillsides and on those pathways praising God together so I pray for the man that gave us the finger and the one that shouted and the ones that shake their heads no. But I know that God will bring us all together to worship and praise. So we pray. We pray that we may understand what we ought to do and that we will be allowed through the grace and love of Jesus Christ to be able to fulfill the work God has given us in the name of the holy and undivided trinity one God amen <laughs>